Hey everybody and welcome back to Ready Steady Play. Today I've got a very special video for you. We are amongst the first crew members to fly on the prototype spaceship, the Nemesis. Unfortunately, our first interstellar voyage has gone awry. While in deep space, we've picked up an unidentified alien life form. Unbeknownst to us, this life form has taken over part of the ship, and now we've been awoken from stasis before reaching Earth in grave, grave danger. One of our comrades has already been killed. As the remaining crew members, we must figure out whether or not the ship still has the capabilities to make it back to Earth, whether or not it needs to be repaired in order to do so, and whether or not that's still the heading. Of course, we will have to do all of this while hiding from the alien life form trying to destroy us before going back into hypersleep to endure the journey back to Earth. This setup and rules video will be a bit different to the ones I normally do in that I'm not going to go in as much comprehensive detail as I might normally because this is a prototype. Having said that, what I will do is give you an overview of the game so that you can follow our playthrough and all of the rules for that. And uh, I will talk about the pieces that we do get in here. I think uh, the game is, for example, the game is for up to five players, but we've only got five characters in this rulebook. And the game instructs you to kill off one before it even begins. Presumably this character was the host to the alien species that now inhabits the ship with us. But uh, in the final production version, you should have six characters, although there may be more on Kickstarter. I don't know. I'm not privy to any information that you're not. But um, there may well be uh, more characters, and it may well increase the player count if the Kickstarter is a big success. I don't know. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get out the board, and I'm going to show you the uh, setup for the game, and I'll talk you through just exactly what's going on, how we set up the Starship Nemesis, and how we uh, survive in this confined space with deadly, deadly aliens. Normally what I do in these videos is give a very comprehensive overview of all the components you get in the box, how they fit into the game, then I set up the game, and then I explain the rules and how to win. However, because this is a prototype and a lot of the components aren't finalized, I'm not going to go into so much comprehensive detail as that, but I will give you a solid overview of the rules in order to allow you to follow along with the playthrough that uh, we'll be publishing, and also to give you an overview of the game and how it works. So without further ado, let's set up the Spaceship Nemesis. This is the game board here, and uh, what we've got is a central hibernation chamber here where all our crew will wake up out of hypersleep. We've then got a network of rooms connected by corridors branching off from this hypersleep chamber down to the engines at the back, the cockpit at the front, and escape pods on the sides here. However, the escape pods will be reached by escape hatches somewhere in the ship. We've also got a little turn tracker down here and a self-destruct tracker just in case you need to blow up the ship. Well, we all start with the pretense that we have the same motive, which is to get the ship back to Earth. We have to make sure the coordinates are set to Earth, we have to make sure the engines are working, and then we have to go back into hypersleep before the ship jumps into hyperdrive. If the ship enters hyperspace before we are able to get into the hypersleep chambers, then we're instantly vaporized, along with every living thing on board the ship, including the alien presence. So, hyperspace is a good thing, but only if we're safely in the hibernatorium. So we have a limited time before the ship makes its hyperspace jump in order to complete those missions, the engines and the cockpit for the uh, coordinates back to Earth, but also to complete our secret ulterior motive. Are we really working together or against our fellow survivors? The very first thing we'll do is take these level one rooms and place them randomly on all of the rooms marked level one on the board here. There are a lot of different kinds of rooms in the game. We've got uh, the canteen, the emergency room is where we can heal any serious wounds we've taken over the course of the game. But I can't imagine why we'd take any serious wounds. We've got a command center here that controls doors and bulkheads around the ship. Very useful if you want to lock certain things in other chambers. Uh, keep them away from your chamber. We've got engine rooms here. This will show us whether or not the engines are working, but we'll still have to go down there to fix them. We've got the uh, monitoring room here that lets us look at other rooms to discover what they are. 
And we've got a shower room here. This will uh, remove alien slime that's uh, gotten on us. The alien slime will, of course, attract aliens to our location. Then we've got the slime room. The aliens have set traps for us in here. And if we go inside, we get covered in alien slime. I guess it's kind of like alien pheromones that makes them come and carry us away. Then we've got the cabins. Uh, this has actually already been removed in a few current iteration of the game. So uh, we won't talk about this room or use it in our playthrough. We've also got these level two rooms. These level two rooms are going to be slightly more tied into our objectives and slightly more important. But they'll be further away from the hibernation chamber. We're probably going to have to explore the whole ship before um, the game is over. But, you know, we might be able to avoid certain dangerous areas. But it all depends on the layout of these rooms. So we have here one evacuation hatch. This allows us to access the escape pods in section A of the board. These are the section A escape pods right here. Then we've got the storage. This is where we keep our equipment and we'll find lots of useful equipment here, particularly weapons and the all important ammunition. Here we've got a generator that enables and disables the auto destruct system. Of course, why would we need to use that? I can't possibly imagine. Aha, the surgery. This is where we remove the aliens that are growing inside of us. But uh, hopefully we'll uh, not need to do that. We'll be able to avoid that situation. Of course, we might not have the choice. Here's the hatch control. You'll need to use this to access the escape pods in the first place. We've got a security room here that can put out rooms that are on fire. Maybe if uh, someone gets trigger happy with a flamethrower, we might need to use this. This is a lab which we can use to analyze alien uh, components, alien DNA, alien eggs, and things like that, hopefully finding a weakness to their structure. This is the alien nest. It's full of eggs. Try and avoid it, if possible. Here we've got communications. This is uh, where we can send signals back to Earth or to other bases in the stars. We may uh, need to go here, depending on uh, what our mission is. Hush, hush. This is Section B evacuation hatch. So this is uh, the same thing, but for Section B of the escape pods. Here are the Section B escape pods right here. Finally, we've got the gun room. I guess also known as an arsenal. This helps us to uh, get more ammunition. Again, very important. So now we're going to take these rooms and randomly put them out on the board. I think there's just enough uh, level 2 rooms, but there will be a level 1 room that is uh, not used. Of course, uh, I could just take out the cabin, but I imagine that uh, in the uh, full version, Kickstarter version of this game, you will have actually uh, a sort of options of rooms that you can use. At least uh, we'll have to see. I can't wait personally to find out what stretch goals await us during this campaign. But uh, we'll randomly put out the level 1 rooms onto the board like this. And there, as you can see, I've got two rooms that I haven't used in addition to the one there. So then we'll put out some random uh, level two rooms. So I have just enough level two rooms to fill the ship, but we might find later on uh, that there are more in the Kickstarter version. Of course, while we've been asleep in the hibernation chamber, aliens have been running around the ship. Probably they came from our dead infected friend here, including the uh, queen alien who is breeding more aliens. It's, uh, it's a real problem. There is unknown damage to the ship, and we've got to figure out what damage has been caused and repair it. Of course, each of these rooms may not be functional when we find it, and may indeed be uh, damaged or have unexpected outcomes. What I have here is a tiny little stack of exploration tokens. I'll put one of these on each room, but I'll show you first what we might expect from them. So we have here five different kinds of exploration tokens. You'll notice that each has a different number in the top right corner. This indicates how many items can be found in the rooms. If we take a look at one of our room tiles here, we'll see that the numbers, actually there are numbers around the outside here. When we flip over the exploration token, we'll set the room on its uh, track here to that number. For example, if we were to flip this token when entering this room, we would set it here to the number two, and that would indicate that we could search the room for items twice, and each time we did that, this would tick down, indicating that eventually it will get to zero and we can no longer find useful items in this room. So this token here, we've, got, we've talked about this, but uh, this means that uh, when we go into the room, the door slams shut behind us immediately, and we're gonna have to figure out how to get that door open again if we wanna go back the way we came. This token here indicates that nothing, nothing eventful happens and actually all is well. Of course, these are a bit of a rarity. This token here indicates that the room is malfunctioning. We'll have to perform a repair action if we want to use this room. This room here indicates that the room is on fire and we put a fire token down into the room. Fire tokens are here and if we don't deal with these, they will spread and uh, spread around the ship causing havoc. 
Finally, this token here indicates that there was recently an alien present in the room. Not only is it malfunctioning like in the malfunction token, but also when we enter the room, we actually have to, there's a double chance of an alien appearing. I'll talk a bit more about that later, but uh, this, is, this is very bad. We really don't want to see this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to shuffle up these event tokens, and then I'm going to lay one out on each of the room tiles here. And when we first encounter these rooms, flipping them open, we will reveal this tile and find out whether or not it's safe or extra deadly. Of course, I have some extra tokens here, which just means that I can't reliably predict what I'm going to find in these rooms when I explore them. Those extra tokens go back in the box. Next up, I've got six engine tokens. There's one set of two for each of the three engines. So each set has damaged and working on it and will indicate whether or not the engine is damaged and working. We might get lucky and all the engines are working at the start of the game. We might get unlucky and they're all damaged. Of course, some of us might have ulterior motives that said uh, that they don't want them to be working. So at the start of the game, I'll randomize these two tokens. I'll put uh, one token out for engine one, which is uh, the top here. And the other token goes off the board. I'll do the same for engine two. And finally for engine three. And now I don't know whether or not the engines are working, but I better find out if I want to get home safely. And then I've got these uh, escape pods here. There will be two escape pods in a one player game, three escape pods in a two or three player game, and four escape pods in a four or five player game. But I would point out that this is just a prototype and these rules are in an early draft stage, so this might be subject to change. Now I put these out randomly, but uh, because I don't know where the uh, hatch to A is, and I don't know where the hatch to B is, it actually doesn't matter whether or not I put two there or two here. The remaining escape pod goes back into the box. And uh, I can leave these on the red side at the moment because they haven't been activated. We have to find the hatch of ac uh, activation room and activate that before the game begins. Now, of course, we need to get the ship back to Earth, so we'll need to set the coordinates to Earth. I have here a deck of coordinate cards which will determine which of the many parallel universes in which we could be playing. Each one has a list on it which is the coordinates for Earth, Mars, Venus, and new galaxies. We might uh, have an ulterior motive to take the ship away from Earth to one of these other coordinates. However, if we're all working together on the same side, we all want to go to Earth, and we'll need to make it to the cockpit to check whether or not the coordinates are set to Earth or some other location. So I'll randomly deal one of these coordinate cards out to the cockpit. This determines where we are in space, and uh, we can look at that coordinate card when we get to the cockpit. The rest of these will be returned to the box. Of course, some people have um, abilities that let them look at this from other parts of the ship, so there's an element of uh, bluffing and trust to that as well. I have here a whole bunch of tokens supplied with the prototype. I imagine these will be different in the course of uh, in the actual game. We're actually going to add a few extra tokens as well to the uh, playthrough that we do, but uh, these are the ones that come with the game, and one of these will determine where the starting coordinates of the ship are set. So here we've got uh, four different uh, coordinate sets, and those will uh, determine the coordinates of the spaceship. Of course, at the beginning of the game, it will be randomized, so it might be that we're heading to Earth from the get-go. Of course, it could be that we're heading somewhere else entirely, and we need to change the coordinates, or not, depending entirely on our secret goal. At the beginning of the game, we're told to set the coordinates to B. So you might have noticed I've got here a whole bunch of different decks of cards, and I'll just quickly tell you what those are. So I've got here three different item decks that look like this. These are the green items that can be found the sh around the ship and tend to be things that help with medical issues. We've got uh, food, for example, which uh, let you do more actions. Bandages that heal wounds. We've got uh, medical kits that heal wounds as well in different ways. We've got uh, somewhere in here some clothing that can help if you get covered with alien slime and you need to get it off you. So these green items can be found in the green rooms around the board. Then I've got the red items. As you can tell, these are more orientated around combat and fighting. We've got, uh, mostly they should be ammunition, but we've got grenades in there as well. These energy charges are ammunitions for our energy weapons. We've got a prototype assault rifle. Every time I get this, it breaks. Uh, we've got uh, a prototype rifle of that kind. I've not had that before. There's also a pistol here. So there's some guns and some grenades, but mostly the... Uh, where is it? The very, very, very valuable energy charges. We'll probably need a lot of these. And these cards can be found in the red rooms. 
And then we've got these yellow cards. These are sort of utility items. They're often tools that can be used for fixing the ship, but we've also got fire extinguishers for putting out fires. We've got uh, more clothes for removing alien gunk. We've got chemicals that can be used to make antidotes to any, uh, alien toxin. These can also be used for making flamethrowers. And uh, we've got, I think that's about it. Very good. So uh, what was I talking about? Making antidotes and stuff. Well, check this out. We've also got these combo cards here. These combo cards depict uh, two different items you can find around the ship on the back. And you can combine these. For example, you can combine chemicals and a med kit to make an antidote. This will remove all infection cards from your hand and any young specimen tokens from your character sheet. Now that might not make sense to you now, but uh, the removal of those things is very, very important if you want to survive this alien encounter. We've also got the uh, energy cells can be uh, combined with the tools to make a taser. Now the taser is the only way you can actually interact with other players aggressively. You see the other players are, uh, you can't shoot them, so don't try to shoot them. Why would you want to shoot them? Well, like I said, you've all got ulterior goals. But uh, what you can do is tase them and leave them in a room with an alien, which is perhaps even crueler or uh, worse than um, shooting them. You can also lock them in a room with fire. Really, if you get creative with a taser, there's a whole lot of ways to deal with, a, with an ally that's not really your ally. We've also got in here the combination of minor med kits and chemicals to create a Molotov cocktail. This is one way to set fire to the ship. It's also uh, a way to uh, damage aliens and stuff like that. Or maybe your friends. Again, fire. It's not your fault that they stepped into the fire. Somewhere in here, we've got a way of creating a flamethrower. Now this is uh, the combination of chemicals and tools. And uh, this is a flamethrower that can be used to burn down uh, the enemy and uh, set a room on fire as well. More efficient than Molotov cocktails. Safer too. I've got here some... Uh, Event cards, these will be turned over every time it's the alien's turn to go. And we've got uh, all different kinds of things. These will determine the alien movement and other fun random events that might happen. These are usually not good for the player. Very rarely the uh, situation might contrive to make them good for us, but uh, more often than not they are deadly scary things that happen that we're going to have to deal with. Then I've got here serious wound cards. These are when uh, our minor wounds develop into serious inhibiting wounds. If we ever get four of these, we're just straight up dead. These are the effects that are caused by taking a serious wound in the game. The effects such as bleeding or arm or leg wounds have different effects on us. Leg wounds inhibit our movement. Arm wounds pretend, prevent us from doing certain actions and using certain items, while body wounds present, prevent us from carrying as many items. So we want to try and remove these effects as quickly as possible, but removing the effects does not always heal the serious wound which has to be done in the emergency room or using certain items. I've got here these uh, panic cards. Now uh, when an alien appears we might well panic and uh, these will determine what happens when we do panic. So uh, we want to try and avoid that if possible as well. Hmm, these are alien weakness cards. Now the alien will be dealt out three different weaknesses at the start of the game that we can research and exploit. We'll have to go to the lab room I showed you earlier to uh, discover what the weaknesses are. And we'll have to take various things there, such as the human corpse of our dead friend from the beginning of the game, an alien corpse that we uh, from an alien we killed if we should be so lucky, and also one of the alien eggs found in the nest or elsewhere around the ship. And uh, these are randomized from the deck at the beginning of the game, so the ones we don't use will go back in the box. But these will tell us just what the weaknesses of the ones we are fighting are. Finally, here we've got the alien attack cards. These are going to determine uh, the damage the aliens do when they attack. These also determine the alien hit points. When we flip them over, we can see down here that it's got a symbol. These are the kinds of aliens that do these attacks. And um, we've also got a uh, type of attack here that gives us the name of the attack and the effect in the middle here. Some of them say that if you have a certain amount of serious wounds, you simply die. For example, bite here, the alien bite, which most of the uh, aliens do. Uh, it says here, if you have at least two serious wounds, you die straight up. So that's pretty bad. And uh, if, you don't, if you don't, you take a serious wound and a card from the contamination deck, which I'll show you in a minute. These are the alien hit points up here. Every time we strike an alien, we determine a number of cards to check its hit points. And then uh, if we exceed the hit points, it's dead. Unfortunately, each time it's randomized, so we never quite know when we're going to kill the alien or when it might run away into the ship and hide in order to recover its health. This is the contamination deck. The backs of the cards actually match your uh, player action deck because these are going to go into your action deck and clog it up 
and uh, cause you problems. But furthermore, they're going to cause you even more problems because do these all look the same? Well, they might, but somewhere in the text on the bottom here, it says uh, infected or not infected. And if you have an infected contamination card in your deck, you are in big trouble. So you might have to go and get this checked out. You can scan yourself. I believe in the surgery, but uh, in one of the rooms on the ship, you can scan these cards and check them. You can also rest to try and get rid of them, but uh, you can only get rid of the non-infected cards if you rest. So if you don't know whether or not you're infected, that's a big risk. But if you can get down to the scanning room, you can uh, take the scanner, which is this handy piece of technology here, high-tech technology, in order to find out whether or not you're infected. Phew, I don't know if you can see here, but it says that I am not infected. I guess I was lucky this time. So there is one more deck of cards you'll find in the game, and those are your player action cards. Those are uh, given to you when you choose your class, so let's have a look at the character classes. So here are the five classes you'll find in this uh, prototype version of the game that we'll be playing with, but uh, you will, I'm sure, have more classes available to you in the final kickstarted version of the game. I know that there's been mention of at least two other classes. Now, whether or not these will come out in the final version, I can't say, so I won't commit to anything. But uh, I know that they've teased a medic and an engineering character, so we'll have to see whether or not those are in the final version. Suffice to say that I'm sure you'll find more, because it's supposed to be a five-player game, but of course at the beginning of the game, someone has already died. This is the captain of the ship, and uh, he's in charge of making sure we all get home safely. Hey, thanks, captain. And he has his sort of abilities, order players around the ship, give players extra actions and stuff like that. Very useful character to have around, especially if he's in the player one's position. So this is the pilot of the ship. She's in charge of making sure we get to where we're going. She's very good at uh, repairing engines and checking the coordinates of the ship and stuff like that. She's uh, very useful to have around, of course, provided that we all want to get home to Earth safely in one piece. We have here the Scout. She's a military type character and she's in charge of making sure that we all get uh, safely through the ship. That uh, she could, She's good at checking out where the rooms are and uh, what's going on in those rooms. She's also uh, good at checking whether or not there are aliens about and maybe avoiding them, which is always a good plan. We've got here the Stormtrooper. This guy looks like someone from uh, Aliens, the second film. I guess uh, he's in charge of making sure that we all get home safe. And then we've got the scientist here. His lack of military training might prove to be a big disadvantage, but uh, he's got other abilities that can help us around the ship as well. Of course, at least one of these crew members didn't make it through hypersleep. So the very first thing we're gonna have to do is determine who died. I have here player boards for all of the characters. These will sh give you uh, an idea of your starting loot and also help you track your wounds and important critical pieces of information over the course of the game. But what I'll do first is I'll take them under the table. I'll shuffle them up and I'll determine one character who we found dead at the beginning of the game. Oh, it's the scientist. What a coincidence. So the scientist is dead, which means that nobody can play as him. And we'll put his body here in the hibernation chamber. And uh, we can always take him to the laboratory and analyze him to discover one of the alien's weaknesses. We've got four character boards remaining. It's uh, first determined player order. So I've got here a deck of five player cards. I'll take out the cards that I won't be using. In this case, players four and five. And I'll take the remaining three cards, I'll shuffle them up, and I'll deal one to each player in the game. It's a bit lonely without my friends here, but uh, I will be joined by friends for our playthrough. In the meantime, let's find out. I am player one. Now that means that I get first choice of who I want to be. And then uh, we've got players two and three. These cards will never change during the course of the game. We are assigned these player numbers throughout the whole course of the game and cannot change them. This is very important because characters will be taking actions in different orders based on these cards and the order in which you move around the ship is critical. So now that we've got our player order cards here, we can get our secret objectives. It's quite important to know your secret objective before you determine your player class because uh, it might influence which one you're going to take. These are the primary goals and uh, the primary goals will tell me at the bottom here which ones to include in a game with a certain number of players. So I've got here all of the ones for games with three players and uh, the remaining cards here which are for four or five player games will be removed from the deck just these two in this prototype then I'll shuffle up these ulterior motives or as they're called here primary goals and uh, I will deal two to each player they will get to choose one of those to keep and one to discard forever 
and then that will determine their motive. We can see here on this one, it says all for one, one for all. At least three of the crew members must survive, including you. Enough with this corporate bullshit. We have to stick with one another like we always did. Well, that's a pretty um, noble goal. A lot of them are not quite so noble. For example, a right moment to strike. Character number one cannot survive this expedition. And if you have sent the signal, you can reveal this card when somebody enters the communication room. Every player gets six light wounds, but minus one for each card in their hand. Intruders present in the room get one hit. Each place a damage marker on the communications room. If uh, you remember correctly, uh, damage means that that room no longer functions. So at this point, I deal everybody two random primary goals. Now, it might be that you have conflicting goals with another player. For example, uh, three players must survive. In a three-player game, that means all of them. And the other player might have player one cannot survive. Now, if they complete their goal before you can, by killing off player one, that means you can no longer complete your primary goal. Fear not, you can still win the game. Of course, all of this is set against the backdrop of surviving the aliens, which, uh, you know, is quite a lofty goal in and of itself. But if you are lucky enough to still be alive, but unlucky enough to be unable to complete your primary goal, you can actually take one of these alternate goals. These alternate goals are usually simplified, and um, most of them in have one prerequisite, such as uh, you cannot have serious wounds or be infected, and you must escape using an escape pod. Escaping using the escape pods are a challenge all on their own right. It's far easier to work together as a team and send the ship back to Earth. Of course, as we just saw, that might not be your mission, and so it might prove more difficult. It might be easier to uh, collect seven starting items and escape in the escape pod. So these alternate goals, at any point you can ditch your primary goal and take one of those, but then you must live with the consequences of your decision. So now that everybody's got their primary goal, we will choose characters, and we'll choose these in player order. So as player number one, I will choose first which character I want to be. Now, I've played before, and I know that the captain is significantly more effective when he's in the first player slot. So I'll probably take the captain, but uh, you are free to take whichever one you want. And uh, let's have uh, the player over here be the pilot, and this player be the stormtrooper. And we'll put the scout back in the box. Now once you've got your starting player card, you can see here we've got a little space to check whether we've sent the signal. Each player has a different signal they might want to send, so uh, we will all have to go and send our signals independently if that's on our goal. We've also got a little thing here to track whether or not we've been slimed with alien slime and whether or not we're in a panic. And then we've got a wound tracker here, and this is where we'll put cubes to indicate if we've got serious wounds. And uh, when we get four of those, we're instantly murdered. We also have back here a little indicator to, uh, that says, Welcome to the game, pilot. Oh, thanks very much. This shows us an outline of our model here. So uh, we'll take our model. That's a useful thing to have. We can go and start here in the hibernation chamber. It also tells us our starting equipment, emergency jump key and shotgun. So I've, put, uh, I've got the pilot's starting equipment here. So I've got two cards that represent those. And then I've got a deck of 10 action cards. Now, I won't, this isn't a deck builder, I won't add or take away cards from this deck over the course of the game, with the exception of the contamination cards we looked at earlier. These are a bit like uh, a sort of an alternate damage to the uh, light wounds and serious wounds that you can take, and these will get shuffled into your deck, causing you to slow down and be able to do less things on your turn. So you will want to analyze these and get them out of your deck, not just because they make you less efficient as a player, but also because in the context of the game they might contain alien contamination that kills you. Now all of these different cards have different actions on them. Some of them are common to all of the uh, player's decks. For example, Interruption, which is kind of like a note card that stops another player doing an action. Everybody's got one of those. And Search, this is where we look through the rooms for uh, different items and stuff like that. Then we've got Demolition, which uh, destroys doors or, uh, da or damages rooms. For example, if you know someone's trying to blow up the ship, you might want to demolish the uh, self-destruct room. But uh, then there's a rest card. These uh, take get rid of panic tokens or allow us to remove the not infected contamination cards from our deck. We've got another search card and taking aim. This is not these these ones are all in everybody's deck. These five cards here, everybody's got them. And I believe everybody's got the same combination: two search cards and one of each of the others. 
then uh, these other cards do appear in some in multiple decks but are not in every single deck for example taking aim i know that the uh, scout and the stormtrooper also have this but that the scientist and the captain i don't believe they have it so we've got to perform a primary weapon attack and reroll the result if you want if you uh, you have to accept the second outcome and you can't take aim with the flamethrower that makes sense i suppose we've got knowledge of the ship which allows you to look at one of the rooms on the ship and then we've got piloting here. This is unique to the pilot, only she has it. And it says, if you're working in a room with a computer, you can check the flight coordinates. And if you're in the cockpit, you can use the cockpit's action without discarding any additional cards. And uh, computer skills here. This allows you to open and close bulkheads in a room you're in, or uh, if you're in a room with a computer, you may use its action without discarding additional cards. And finally, repair. So this is actually, uh, this allows you to repair damaged rooms Remember the, uh, the damage tokens we looked at earlier, which are like this, which show that the room is damaged and cannot be used currently. This repair allows you to get rid of those. Uh, and if you're in the engine room, you can also check the state of the engine tokens. And if they are damaged, you can repair them. Fortunately, this one was already working. But if it was damaged, we could repair it. And uh, usually uh, that actually takes more cards, but the pilot's actually extra efficient at doing that as well. So this is a sort of unique pilot version of the repair card. This also means that it can't be used while you're in combat, so don't bother trying to repair the room if you're under attack by an alien. So I'm not going to go through all of the decks for all of the characters in the game, because uh, they may be subject to change and over the course of the Kickstarter and as the rules are finalized. But um, what I will do is uh, say that if you'd like to see some more different kinds of action cards, come back for our playthrough. We'll be doing a full playthrough of the game when uh, I'm joined by Michael and Ben for that. So I'll put my Stormtrooper and my Captain in the Hibernation Room as well. We're all there ready to start the game. At this point, we'll choose which primary goal we want to keep, and we'll put the other one back in the box. Now, we do have a few more bits and pieces, just general admin to take care of before we start the game. All of our guns have ammunition, so we'll need to get some tokens to represent ammunition, and we'll need to make sure that our guns are loaded before we begin the game. You definitely don't want to start the game with an empty barrel. So I've got here the Intruder Board. And the intruder board is used to track the queen's health. Now, most of, the, most of the time, alien health is tracked on their base, but the queen is so tough to kill that she's got her own health tracker here because you might not be able to fit all the damage tokens on her base. Is that scary? Well, it should be because it is. We've also got a little set here for egg piles. We'll put some of these eggs down here on that um, egg token there, and these represent all the eggs in the nest that the queen has laid at uh, different points in the game for maybe due to an event or because we've been running around in the nest ourselves. These eggs could come into play. They might uh, hatch into um, alien larvae that infect us with alien embryos, or they might, you know, sort of uh, be dropped somewhere and hatch later. We'll find out. We've also got spaces here for each of the three alien weaknesses. Remember, we looked at those earlier. So I'll deal out one of these weaknesses to each of these slots here. And uh, it says intruder corpse, intruder egg, and crewman body. Those are the three different things I spoke about being analyzed in the lab. So when we go to the lab and analyze those, we'll flip over the appropriate card and find out what the weakness is in this game. The rest of those weakness cards can go back in the box because they won't be needed. It's got here a handy key to the different kinds of alien symbols. We've got the egg slash young symbol up here. Below that is the adult alien symbol, then the breeder symbol, and finally the queen symbol. And uh, these are just to remind you because those are used in various different places in shorthand for the different kinds of aliens. Over the course of the game, we'll be going into this bag here to draw out alien tokens to find out what aliens have appeared if we make too much noise or track aliens in another manner. Now, at the start of the game, we put a certain number of tokens in this bag, and uh, we can add more later as, you know, alien larvae mature into young aliens, which grow up into adult aliens and eventually breeders. So these are the tokens that start in the bag. This is called the old intruder. This is in fact the adult alien, and you can probably see a picture of the model there on it. Pretty scary stuff. So uh, there are there is a little bit of inconsistency in the names here, but that's just a prototype thing. This is the adult alien. We've got here the larva. Oh, here's the queen alien. Yep, that's right, she starts in the bag. Because she's on the ship when you arrive, you know? She's the one laying all the eggs. She's made that nest somewhere on the ship. We also start with another larva and an old intruder and a young intruder here as well. So we start the game with two adults, two larva, one young intruder and one queen, plus one adult per player. So in this case, I'm setting up a three-player game. So I'll just go ahead 
and get three more adults from the stack and add those to the game bag. Lots and lots of aliens. Don't worry, we shouldn't run out. If for any reason I should ever need to add an alien egg to the bag, I've got some round alien egg tokens here that match the other kinds of tokens. So this is the turn counter for the game. It counts down from 15 all the way to zero. When it reaches zero, the ship will blast into hyperspace and anyone who's not in stasis will be killed. This includes all the aliens on board the ship, so it is the way in which we're going to survive this mess. But unfortunately, if we haven't completed our goals by then, fixed the engines and set the cockpit to go to Earth, then it doesn't matter that we've gone into hyperspace because we're going to lose the game anyway. Now there is a color coding here because we cannot use the escape pods until we get to track uh, section 6 here. Of course, uh, if self-destruct is activated, this will start ticking down as well. We can deactivate the self-destruct only once it reaches the red section. So we must uh, wait until it gets in here, kind of like the countdown on the... Uh, on any dramatic self-destruct mode for movies and of course um, if it ever reaches this then the spaceship explodes and we all lose or maybe we don't. Now we've all got these sort of basic common starting objectives which is to point the ship towards earth and make sure two of the three engines are in working order. Then if we've uh, we've got to complete our secret goal as well and provided we've done that we can come back to the hibernatorium to go back to sleep and live uh, to see, you know, to victory, hopefully. But uh, if we, for whatever reason, don't accomplish our primary goal, then we personally lose. If uh, one of these conditions are not met, we uh, all lose, unless, of course, one of us had a primary goal that was counter to these. If at any point a player dies or the uh, self-destruct is activated, then these escape pods will automatically become active. However, if we want to activate them before those times, we will have to find the prerequisite room in which we can take an action to activate them. We put our miniatures into the hibernatorium, which is the starting room for the game. Every player draws six cards from their action deck and gets ready to take some actions. So, let's have a look at turn order. Fortunately for me, turn order is listed handily on these player guides. So, uh, these are also the cards that determine player order. So, we've got here a round order and the basic actions you can take on your turn. So, a player uh, on their turn will take actions until they pass. These are based on the action cards in their hand. Then it will be, uh, each player will have a go at that. And uh, when the third player or final player in the order passes, it will be the intruder phase, in which case any intruders on the board will attack, then any fires on the board will continue to spread, then any events uh, will draw an event card and uh, that could be intruders moving or other things taking place. Um, these are the event cards here. We've got intruder movement listed at the top and then at the bottom here something else happens. For example this says that uh, move all the intruder tokens that are not in the fight to the pool, which means that any intruders in empty rooms will go back in the bag and potentially reappear later. Furthermore, uh, all players in a room with no intruder have to perform a noise roll. So that's just peachy. Finally, it's the end phase. We'll move on those time markers I just showed you and we'll draw back up to our six action cards. Um, the number of action cards we draw at this moment will alter depending on the state of our characters. Then we've got uh, basic actions here and these are the basic actions we can do on our turn. Movement, which involves moving around the ship. Escape, which means uh, moving away from intruders that are trying to kill you. Use slash pass items, which is using items that you've got on the table or uh, passing them to another player. Pick up a heavy object. This typically means pick up the bodies of crewmen or um, aliens in order to analyze them in the lab. It could also mean picking up an egg. Typically, you can only carry one heavy object at a time. Shoot, which means shoot your gun at an alien. That's pretty self-explanatory. And close combat. This means hitting an alien in close combat. Now, usually this results in you taking serious wounds because they are made of blades, and I heard they bleed acid, but I'm not sure. 
In any case, you don't ever want to resort to close combat unless it's an absolute last resort. There's no minimum range for shooting or anything like that, so if you can shoot a gun, if you've got ammunition to shoot your gun, then you should do so. And if you can't or have run out of ammo, escape is probably more advisable to close combat in almost every way. And then we've got special actions. These are the actions listed on your card. We've already had a look at the pilot cards. Then we've got room actions, which are actions you can take based on the rooms that you're in. And we'll have a look at those a bit more in a minute. So we've got six cards that we've drawn from our deck at the start of the game. And uh, each of these cards can be used to expend an action. Whenever you do an action in the game, you'll have to discard at least one card, possibly more. Now, some actions, such as shoot, can be done by discarding a card, or you can discard a card from your hand, like this uh, captain card here is called Suppressive Fire, which means shooting, but also escaping. And uh, it allows you to escape with less penalty, basically, but uh, it doesn't actually do any damage to the aliens. So you've got sort of these special card actions that you might use which sort of supersede the other more common actions. But if I just wanted to shoot at the alien and kill it, I would just discard this card and say I'm taking a shoot action. So in this case, if I want to move, I can discard any of these six cards in order to move. And I must decide which of these cards I think I'll need. For example, I might decide Suppressive Fire is not that useful to me right now because there are no aliens on the board. Of course, aliens can show up at any time, and I'll explain how that happens as we go through these actions. Suffice to say that uh, I might need Suppressive Fire. So uh, maybe I decide, well, without much more information about my opponents, Interruption is something I can get rid of at this stage. So I decide to discard Interruption and move into an adjacent room. So I'll take my captain figure here and I'll decide where I'm going to go. This is the exploration action. I'm going to explore one of these rooms. Now later on when uh, the rooms are explored I just do a movement action but they're basically the same thing with the exception that I don't turn over the tile and reveal the exploration token. Now I, I must commit to moving into a room. I can't uh, explore the room by revealing the stuff and then deciding I don't want to go in there. Furthermore, before I reveal anything one of my compatriots might decide they want to come with me. If they decide, uh, this is a sort of a unique element of the game where we can decide if we want to move together as a squad. And the advantages of moving together as a squad is that you make less noise, which attracts fewer aliens, means it's less, we're less likely to attract aliens. Furthermore, it means that if we do get unlucky and attract an alien, then actually we're all in the same room together and we might just have a chance to defeat it in combat. But uh, I've discarded this interruption card. I'm going to move my captain. I decide maybe that I want to check the coordinates of the ship first and uh, decide to go into this room here. Now I say to my opponents in turn, or my, now I say to my teammates in turn order, would you guys like to come into the room with me? In which case, uh, let's say the stormtrooper decides to follow me. He'll discard one card from his hand in order to take that free action. And that's discarded face up, so I guess I can see what he decided to get rid of. Now uh, the pilot decides that she wants to do her own thing and she's not going to come with us. So we resolve this uh, explore action. First by revealing the explore token, I've got a one item and a fire token, which means we've just, I've just taken my stormtrooper buddy into a room that's on fire. So that's just great. I've uh, we've gone into this room on fire, but what we'll do is we'll flip this token here. It's the slime room. Great. So now we're both covered in slime in a room on fire. Now you'll notice that the slime token, unlike the rooms I showed you during setup, doesn't actually have an item chart on it. That's because everything in here is covered with slime and has become unusable. So I can ignore this number on the top right. I'll place the room like this and I'll put our figures in it. We're going to get some slime on our character sheets here. And now I'm going to have to roll for noise. The D10 noise die here has a number of symbols on it. The numbers refer to different directions in which we might hear noise. The exclamation mark refers to a surprise attack, and the X refers to silence. Now the surprise attack just means that any aliens on the board move towards us. So this is really bad if uh, there's an alien nearby, but if there's no aliens on the board, it's actually silence as well and can be ignored which is great. The, uh, the sudden attack, of course, means also that uh, it's only unengaged aliens. So any aliens in adjacent rooms who are already killing our friends won't, won't bother coming to find us. But uh, in this case, I'll uh, roll the die and see what happens. So I've rolled a four, which means I'm going to take a noise token and put it on the four slot by the room we've just entered. So it might be a little hard to see here on my board, but there's a one in this corridor here and a two in this corridor here. We've got a three up here in this corridor and a four in this corridor. So I'm going to put a noise token here in this corridor and that indicates that we've heard a noise here and um, 
If there are ever two noise tokens in a corridor, then an alien appears. When an alien or intruder appears, I'll go into the bag, I'll randomly draw one out of the bag, and I'll put it in the room with us. But I'm lucky in the sense that there's no alien here yet, so we are free to explore the room of slime as we want. Now, we can continue to move. I should explain that uh, I've just shown you the noise die. So if we're covered in slime, it means that we treat the silence result on the noise die, which is that X, as a sudden attack. So again, the slime is actually kind of negligible so long as there's no aliens on the board. But the minute the aliens appear and start moving around the board, we're more likely to attract them if we're covered in slime. So we've got to be careful. So now that I've resolved the silence roll, I'm going to go ahead and put a fire token down in this room. Now I can ignore the fire in the sense that uh, I don't have to worry about it damaging me yet, provided I don't stay in this room. But the fire is going to spread, so finding a way to put out the fire is probably a very useful thing to do. I know that uh, in the yellow rooms I can find fire extinguishers. I also know that somewhere there's a security room that can put out fires. Um, we both, uh, players and aliens, will take damage from fire. So it can be used tactically, but it's a bit early days for that, and I'd probably like to just put it out. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and advance on into this next room, and the stormtrooper is going to come with me because he doesn't want to be burned at the end of the round. So once again, we both discard a card from our hands in order to do that move, and uh, we only roll for silence once because we're moving together. So this room has four items in it, and it's malfunctioning. So this is the Section B evacuation hatch, so we can get into the escape pod here, and uh, that's a special room action. So if we decide to do a special room action in here, which is to get into the escape pods in Section B, we discard two cards, and then we take our figures and put it into the relevant escape hatch, which we looked at earlier, the escape pods there. And uh, it, this is a white style room with four items in it. So I showed you those item decks earlier, and those items de decks correspond to different colors of rooms. For example, this room here is a red room, which means that if I search for items in that room, I will look in the red item deck. If I search for items in the white room, I can actually choose which of the decks I want to look at for items. Of course, this, item's ac this room is actually malfunctioning, which means if I want to go into the escape pods by taking the room action, I will have to repair the room first using the repair cards we looked at in the player decks earlier. Search is a special action we talked about earlier. It's on the cards. We looked at the cards in the player deck here. Everybody has two search cards in their deck. At any point, you can discard this card to take the search action listed on the card. And in this case, if I were to do it in this room, I would tick this down to three. I would choose one of the three item decks I wanted to look at, and I would draw a card from that item deck, and that would be an item that I can now hold. I can carry as many items as I want, but I can only carry two weapons. Weapons include the prototype weapons I find in the, I mean, the red item deck. The weapons also include a taser and a flamethrower that I build here. And furthermore, we can actually swap our starting gear amongst our characters as well. So I might take the shotgun off the pilot, but uh, as I've got a revolver here already, that would be my two items. I couldn't then make a taser or a flamethrower. Now that I've completed this action, I'll roll my silence check again. Now you can't see that because it's gone on the floor, but I've actually rolled a one. And the one here is actually a technical corridor. What's a technical corridor? Well, do you remember the scene in Aliens where they're crawling through the air ducts? In this game, air ducts are called technical corridors. There are eight technical corridors all around the ship and they're connected to the different rooms uh, and indicated by these spaces. When a noise is made in a technical corridor, we'll take the noise token and we'll put it down here on the technical corridor space. What this means is that when noises are heard in the technical corridors, it is far more likely for an alien to burst from the air ducts and attack us than other corridors on the board because the minute a second token appears here, the alien will appear in the room where the, where the noise was heard. So we're currently still safe, but anyone else going into any one of the eight rooms with the technical corridors will, of course, run the risk of triggering the alien. Now what we're going to do here is fast forward ahead a bit in time. So in this case our pilots wandered over here to check the engines and we'll uh, reveal these rooms. We've got here an engine room which is uh, damaged and has two items in it. That's a yellow room so you'd search the yellow item deck in there. We've got here a uh, surgery and that's, uh, that's where we can remove the alien infection. And uh, that's actually a bulkhead room so we set that to one. 
We can then uh, discard this uh, exploration token, but we get a door and we put it down on the board. So the game comes with these funky space doors, and these are uh, bulkheads, and they're going to close up and prevent access through corridors. For example, this room here had the bulkhead exploration icon, so the door slams shut behind me as I enter that room. Now what this means is that if any alien were to try to go through here, the first time it tries to go through here, I would remove the door. The second time, it would uh, just go through. So at least the door sort of functions as stopping it. I would also uh, point out that uh, if the alien does destroy the door, the door is just placed like that, it means that we can't close that door now because it's destroyed. These bulkheads are pretty tough though, so if you've got a couple of aliens in a room trying to get through, the bulkhead will stop them all, but they will destroy it. Once it's been destroyed, it's just placed like this. It can never be closed again. Furthermore, we can also destroy bulkheads. If another player traps you in a room for whatever reason, their nefarious intent, then they then you can destroy the bulkhead to escape, but you can never close it again. So if you're being chased by something, then that's a bad time. So in this case, the door is slammed shut behind me. I'll need my demolition card in order to get back through there. That is a card in everyone's deck. Or I can find the command room. Or I can just, you know, go around another way. There's plenty of other ways to go around. What I will do is skip to the intruder phase, and uh, I'll also show you what happens when an alien appears. If uh, there is an intruder on the board, it will try to attack. It will only attack crew members in the room with it. And when it attacks, we draw one of these uh, fury cards here, which are the same ones with the hit points on them, and see if the symbols match, in which case it'll do an attack and possibly just straight up kill you. We'll draw one of these event cards. Boom. Sudden attack. Uh-oh. So this card reads that I will be moving the adult and breeder aliens three uh, along the three space. Now remember we looked at those corridors earlier when we were putting out sound tokens. This is a three corridor, so any aliens in this room would move along this corridor here following this instruction. So aliens will only ever move one room when they do move. Three, of course, there's no intruders on the board yet, so no intruder movement will happen. And also, this says here that anyone carrying an egg, well, the egg hatches and a larva attacks them, so that's great. So, uh, we would resolve that. And finally, um, any people in a room with no intruder now must roll for noise. So, this is done in player order. We start with the captain. Now, he's rolled a one. And um, if you recall, he's in the room with the technical corridor. And there's a sound in the technical corridor. So, that's token number two, which means that an alien is going to spawn. So, I go here into the bag to discover what alien is going to spawn and attack them. It's an adult. An adult alien. These are by far the most common and uh, they're pretty deadly. Um, I'm not happy about that. I'm not, you know, it is what it is. So uh, let's go ahead and grab one of our adult alien models and stick it down here in the room with our troops. Did you hear something? Well, I don't know. It's probably just the wind. Oh no, it's a fucking adult alien. And he's here to make your life misery. So, now we are in combat. These noise tokens are removed. We've discovered the source of the noise. If you remember our chart here for the intruder phase, the event card is the last thing that happens, which means that the alien is not actually going to attack this round, which is fortunate. However, our two guys here are going to have to make panic checks for the alien that just appeared. And that means drawing a card off the top of the panic deck. So if I have the same number of cards as this or fewer in my hand, then I must suffer the effects of the card. However, if I have more cards than this in my hand, I am okay. Now it says here, if the player has less than five cards in his hand, and he, he takes a damage marker on the room and takes a panic token. So, in this case, I would be okay because I have more than one card in my hand, but uh, if not, I would uh, take a panic token, and also I would damage the room, I guess in my panic of... I've, I've messed up the equipment. But also note that I put a panic token on my sheet. If you recall, there's a special spot for panic tokens next to our slime slot here. So that's if I fail, I'd put that down there. And if I have a panic token on my sheet, then I fail automatically all future panic tests and suffer the text on the card. So I really don't want to become panicked. So I resolve the card for our stormtrooper. Well, luckily he's okay too. So. We've both survived our panic checks, and we can now fight the alien on our next turn. Or escape. Bravely, I mean, a tactical retreat. So now that I've resolved the panic cards, I do just have to quickly finish resolving the event card. 
our stormtrooper who's next in line doesn't actually have to roll for noise because now he's in a room with an intruder. But our engineer over here does still have to roll for noise. And that's a sudden attack. Fortunately, there's no aliens on the board that aren't engaged in combat or adjacent to our uh, pilot anyway because she's miles away down the other end of the ship. So that is okay for her. So now we go into the end phase. So then I would move on the turn marker down to turn 14. And what I would do is I would... Um, draw more cards. Now, in this case, we draw back up to six. So we can also choose first to discard any number of cards that we want. So any cards that we've decided we haven't used during the course of our turn, we can uh, keep. If there's any we don't want, we can discard them. But uh, if there were some that we did want to hang on to, then we can, we've still got those. We'll draw back up to six. Unless you're in combat with an alien. If you're in combat with an alien, regardless of how many cards you have, you draw two. Which means that if you've hung on to a lot of cards, you could potentially go over six. But more than likely, you've only got a few left and you'll just draw two, which makes you more vulnerable to panic and also gives you less options next turn in terms of uh, fighting and what to do against the alien menace. So with everybody having drawn their cards at the end of the round, let's have a look at how our two friends here are going to deal with the alien menace. <laughs> Oh no, well, I guess we gotta deal with this now. So our captain's gonna fire at the alien with his revolver. So he's only got three cards because he used them all last turn and only drew two more. But he's got his revolver here that he starts the game with and he's got two ammunition on the revolver. Two shots before he runs out and can't use it anymore. The revolver has this little symbol here which means that it can be used in combat. And uh, this is a sort of a, this counts as a shoot action but uh, not an item action. And uh, it says every time you give at least one hit, you give one additional hit. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna roll the combat die. Now the combat die uh, has one hit on it and one hit hits an alien. And uh, that hits any kind of alien. We've also got an X, which is a complete futz. You screwed up and you hit nothing at all. We've also got two hits, which is great. That's two hits on any alien type. Then we've got all of the different alien symbols, and uh, these only hit the alien that uh, is depicted on the symbol. So you can see it's quite easy to hit eggs and young aliens, but uh, the breeder is a bit more difficult to hit, or the adult, sorry, there's the adult alien, and um, the, uh, the, the queen and the breeder don't actually have any symbols on here at all, because they're really difficult to hit. They can only be hit with the actual hit symbols. That means you only have a one in three chance of even hitting them at all and they have the most hit points. Note that uh, if you roll the adult symbol that will also hit the uh, young and uh, egg alien types as well. So we'll, the captain will take a shoot action which means he removes one of the ammunition cubes from his gun here and then he rolls the attack die. So I've rolled a young alien symbol that's not enough to hit this adult so I've missed. I can take the shoot action again if I want. Every time I do this, I'm discarding one of the cards in my hand. I've only got three, so this will be my last opportunity. Also, it's my last ammunition anyway. So now I've rolled the adult uh, alien, so that's a hit. Uh, so I've got one hit, so I give two hits because my gun is big and powerful. So hits are indicated simply by these same cubes. So I take two uh, damage cubes and I put them down here on the adult alien's base to indicate he's taken two damage. Now I have to check to see whether he's dead, which means I draw cards from this alien deck here and um, try to match the hit points. So for the adult alien or smaller, I draw just one card, but for the breeder um, and the queen alien, I draw two cards to check their hit points. So let's have a look and see if he's dead. Oh, now it's three. So three is more than two, which means he lives. So our captain has one card left which he decides to hang on to because he just wants to avoid panic if that happens again. Um, and uh, it's of no use to him anyway. He's hoping our stormtrooper can finish the fight. Now the stormtrooper might well leave the captain to die. Or he might fire at the alien and save the day. So the stormtrooper has the assault rifle here with five ammunition on it. And it says here that every time you score at least a hit you give an additional hit. So this is another good weapon. And uh, the Stormtrooper can discard a card to attack the alien here. And that's a hit, so that's two hits. And I'll check the alien's hit points again. It's three, so the eight, it's six! The alien's not dead. We'll have to attack again. That's two hits, that's three hits. It's a four, the alien's definitely dead this time. 
So the alien is dead and the threat is neutralized. I can remove the model or I can leave it here to represent the alien corpse turning it on its side. I can just put down this symbol here if that's a bit if uh, that clutters the board too much. But the important thing is that this token has been removed from the pool, so there's one less alien on board the ship to worry about. Also, this is a heavy object that we can pick up and take to the laboratory to analyze looking for alien weaknesses. But uh, we can freely escape. Now let's say for a minute we hadn't managed to kill this alien, or it was a much worse kind of alien. See, for example, let's pretend for a minute that it was an alien breeder. These are much worse. <laughs> much, much worse. So. This guy, uh, we're very unlikely to defeat him in combat. So let's, uh, let's have a look at what happens when we take the escape action. So taking an escape action is actually basically exactly the same as when uh, you are being attacked by an intruder. So we can kind of cover them both at the same time. When you escape, you just move into an adjacent room. Um, you move into an adjacent room that doesn't contain an intruder. So if you're surrounded by intruders, you can't actually escape, which is, you know, a problem. But if um, you can escape, then you just move into an adjacent room. You might have a card like Suppressive Fire, which allows you to escape without actually taking combat, but you do have to use ammunition in your gun in order to do it. But if uh, you don't have anything that will help you, you simply discard an action card to take the escape action, you move into an adjacent room, and then you resolve an attack against your character. It's worth noting that uh, you cannot move with people, so you can't escape together, because everyone's in a blind panic because of the giant scary alien. You can't uh, team up on this one. You've got to escape individually. So with that in mind, let's see how we resolve an attack against a player. So here the captain's escaped into the cockpit, but unfortunately he didn't have any cool cards to do it with, so he's going to have to take uh, an attack against him. So let's have a look at one of these cards and see what happens. So in this case, we've got the tail attack. Now this is only used by the queen, so the captain has escaped successfully. Let's see what would have happened if he didn't. Here's a claw attack. If we draw on this instead, we can see that all of the aliens, adult and up, use this attack. And it says if he has three serious wounds, he dies. Fortunately, we don't have any serious wounds yet. Then it says if he doesn't, he gets one light wound and a card from the contamination deck. So we've got uh, here our player boards, which have damage on them. Um, and I've just taken a light wound. So when I take a light wound for the first time, I put a cube down here on the light wound space of my tracker. The next time I would take a light wound, it progresses down here. And then uh, if I would take another light wound, it turns into a serious wound. Every time I take a serious wound, I draw one of these cards from the serious wound deck. And uh, these are very, very difficult to get rid of. In fact, they're almost impossible to get rid of. So I want to try to avoid taking serious wounds when I can. If a card ever says take three light wounds, I might as well just take a serious wound. So that's basically how that works. Let's, um, it's not an ideal situation. We want to try and avoid it. Remember, in close combat, you do uh, damage. You get to roll the, the damage die, but uh, you automatically take a serious wound by doing a close combat attack. So maybe don't do that unless you really need to kill this alien and it's a last-ditch attempt to escape to safety. But, um, you know, try and avoid that wherever possible. So there is another alien type in here that we haven't really looked at called the larva. They're a bit different to the other aliens. So let's say that uh, our pilot on her way back through the hibernatorium has set off a noise and has drawn a larva from the bag. So here's the larva token here she's just drawn. So we'll find the uh, larva icon for her there. Larva look like this and they're actually a lot more like tokens than models really. You can put them on the board but as far as I'm aware you never need to. You see Larva don't actually exist on the board moving around. Um, as far as I'm aware, there might be event cards or something that do that. But when you would draw an, when you would have an encounter with a larva, the first thing that happens is you get a contamination card. When you get a contamination card, you simply put it in your discard pile of your deck. And that's going to go round and round your deck, causing you problems, clogging up your deck, and you need to get rid of it, especially if you're infected. Furthermore, at the end of the game, you check all the contamination cards in your deck. If any of them are infected, you actually lose the game. So you can go through the entire process of winning the game, but if you are in fact infected when you leave the ship, then you're done for. So fortunately, our pilots actually already found the surgery, but if you ever get infected, you're gonna to need to find the surgery and go in here and do the room action. So in order to take the surgery action, we're gonna to have to discard two cards from our hand here. It's gonna allow us to uh, scan all of the, um, it doesn't actually say it here on the tile, 
We're going to check all of the contamination cards in our deck, our hand, and our discard pile, and any that come up infected we can remove. But if we haven't done this before the end of the game, and there's any infected cards remaining in our deck, we'll scan them at the end of the game, and if we find one, we lose. So we need to make sure that we repair this room and take this action should we become contaminated with an infected card. Now back to our larva here. If uh, we do encounter a larva, we actually put this onto our player sheet. Now we've got a larva on us. Presumably this sort of represents that scene in Alien when the face is attached to your face. I don't quite know how the larva attached to you in this game. It could also be a bit like that, that scene in um, Wrath of Khan where the thing goes in their ear. I don't know, but uh, it's pretty awful. We need to get that larva off us. We can attack the larva, which uh, requires us to roll one of these dice. And uh, we just need one hit. So if we get uh, any hit or anything like that, so anything short of the uh, full-on miss, then we've removed the larva and we're all right. But uh, we don't really want to be leaving it on there very long. We also count as in combat when the larva's on us, which means that if there's a larva attached to us during the end round, uh, the end phase, we only get to draw two cards instead of drawing back up to six. The thing about the larva that's really scary is that it doesn't attack you in the same way as a normal... Uh, alien might attack you. You see, the thing about the larva, instead the larva token is removed from your player board and uh, it's replaced with a young intruder token. If you end the game with a young specimen inside of you, you lose. I mean, you, there's no real way to win with an alien inside of you, right? Furthermore, some of these event cards feature the uh, young specimen simply emerging from you, which uh, is of course fatal, so you kind of want to get it out before that event card comes up. And uh, you never know when that's going to happen, so that's pretty awful. And uh, if it does come out of you, then you just uh, you take it and you put it in the bag. And uh, at some point it might grow into an adult, old adult alien, and then you've just got more aliens in the bag. You know, it'd be nice if there were no aliens in the bag, and then you could make all the noise you want, and there'd be nothing to come out of the bag. But that's extremely unlikely. So um, if you do want to get the young specimen off of you, you have to go into the surgery, you perform the surgery action, you take one light wound because, let's face it, you're performing self-surgery. A bit like that scene in Prometheus. Have you seen that scene? This is basically that. Let's resolve that situation. You get rid of the young intruder. You can get rid of any contaminated uh, contamination cards you have. Note that this does not get rid of the not infected contamination cards you have. Those kind of represent something a bit more sort of unknown, maybe panic or maybe a non-fatal alien infection. But if you want to get rid of those, you need to either use the rest card in your deck or you can go, there's a canteen where you can chill out and have a coffee and get rid of those that way. But um, there's also a nest. This is the queen's nest. If you're in the nest, you always count as being in combat, and it's full of eggs. And uh, there's <clears throat> cards in the event deck that cause the eggs to hatch into uh, larva. Larva go back in the bag. That makes things worse. You really don't want the larva around because they're going to come out and sit on you, and you have to attack them to get rid of them, or else they'll put young specimens inside of you. So uh, it's worth noting that uh, fire only spreads as the result of an event card. And uh, when fire um, spreads, it will go uh, in the direction uh, indicated on the card. But anyone caught in the room with fire at, during the end phase, uh, if they're an alien, they'll take one damage. And if they're a human, they'll take a serious wound. But uh, fire doesn't affect you in the hibernatorium, so that's okay. At least you're safe in there for some reason. If you want to get back into the hibernation chamber at the end of the game, that's an action. You have to discard a card to do that. If you want to get into the uh, chamber here, it's two cards. And um, you also have to roll for noise if you want to get into an escape pod. And if the noise happens to attract an intruder, then you can't get in the escape pod because now there's an intruder in the room. should be noted that all room actions are non-combat actions. So if you're in a room with an intruder then uh, or an alien, then uh, don't think about stopping to use the computer. Now, at the end of the game, you will get back into the hibernatorium. Of course, you need to make sure that there are no aliens in there because you can't do the room action if there's aliens in there. But uh, if there are no aliens in there, then you can take an action, discard one card from your hand, get into the stasis chamber, and uh, provided the ship's heading to Earth, and the engines are working, and that's in line with your secret agenda, then you're actually safe. You've won the game. Congratulations. Probably, unless you've got an infected contamination card still in your deck. But uh, if you've got rid of all of those, then uh, you're good to go. You're laughing. Um, of course, that's uh, easier said than done when the ship is full of stuff like this, other kinds of aliens, or worse, the queen alien. 
But uh, if you want to find out, you know, just uh, how scary these aliens are, or if you want to witness the Queen Alien in action, please uh, make sure that you come back tomorrow, where I'll be playing through the game with uh, my friends Michael and Ben, and we'll all be taking on different roles and secret agendas. And uh, let me tell you, our game was quite an epic, epic event. You know, I, I was uh, hoping for a good playthrough and I was well rewarded. So I really hope you'll come back and join us for that. You'll consider subscribing to the channel. And if you've enjoyed this video, you'll throw down a like. And uh, thank you so much for watching. And uh, be sure to check out Awaken Realms Kickstarter on uh, their Kickstarter page. I'll put a link in the video description below, or you might have found this video there. And uh, thank you so much for watching again. And uh, I'll see you all in another video.